Yeah, we're running a little bit past uh, when we should start, but it's in the short, and as you notice, the room is sort of hard to find. <laughs> yes, that's right. Actually. I spent like five, I spent five minutes wandering around. <laughs> Hello, Robert. We're running a little bit on the uh, late side of things. The room is in a hard place to find, so we're going to be starting a little delayed. start in a minute. It's almost five after.
Okay, let us let us get started. Uh, welcome to BFD. I'm Jeff Haas. Uh, Rashad is unable to uh, co-chair for this session because he is unable to make it to Singapore. Uh, quick check, can everybody hear me fine through the microphone? Yes, good. Somebody in the back, good. Yes, thank you. Um, no, uh, Xiaomin has uh, agreed to uh, take notes so that I can pay attention to the session. As you notice, I have a few things to operate here. Uh, we have four sessions today. Uh, you know, covering this, uh, of course, the thing dies on me. Full screen. Okay, so quick agenda. We're going to go through a chairs update. We're going to go through BFD for VXLAN, BFD for large packets. Both of these have been through working group last call. And we are supposed to have a presentation on one-armed BFD. Is there one of the document authors in the room to present that? OK, thank you. So document status, uh, BFD for VXLAN uh, had a working group last call. It created a lot of discussion, you know, over 300 messages, which is uh, very unusual for BFD. Uh, hopefully, we got over the majority of the, the discussion. Uh, I believe it is Greg that will actually be giving the uh, presentation on uh, the current status of things. Uh, second item is we also uh, tried to call working group last calling BFD for large packets. This actually prompted some discussion that had been stalled out. And uh, we need to get some revisions for that. I'll be covering uh, that uh, without wearing my chair's hat uh, for this purpose. Uh, as part of working on BFD unsolicited, a minor change was discovered to be needed to make at the last second in the BFD Yang module. Uh, Rashad has uh, asked the RFC editor for procedure for taking care of that, and that should actually be in progress. Once we clear that point, uh, that will clear a Yang doctor uh, comment on the BFD unsolicited draft, and I believe that will be finished with working group last call. We have a little bit of an interesting situation for the BFD authentication documents. Uh, it's a series of three of them. One of them has uh, IPR on them that uh, has generated some uh, discussion. During IETF 105, you know, we put forth to the group that we believe the documents are at this point in a technically viable and a complete standpoint. Uh, no further technical commentary was given on them. We also asked if, they, uh, if the working group would be willing to allow these to proceed. Uh, it is perfectly allowable for IETF to have documents that have IPR on them. Uh, the IPR holder, in this case Sienna, noted that uh, their IPR is no more restrictive than other IETF uh, BFD uh, IPR, including my employer, Juniper, which is uh, got IPR and RFC 5880 for BFD itself. I uh, spent a little bit of time uh, oh, uh, in the working group discussion. Uh, there was a small amount of uh, show for taking the documents forward. It was not a huge list of the group. So we have some small support. I believe uh, Greg's objections still stand. So that's at least you know, one public you know, uh, request not to. I've been uh, spending a little bit of the ITF uh, trying to discuss with the people about uh, our consensus process with regard to this. The uh, general outcome of that discussion is that uh, the main consideration IETF has for intellectual property restrictions on documents is their implementability. So if uh, the IPR would prevent somebody from actually being able to implement it, that's the main consideration. Uh, the sense that has been given from the intellectual property holders is that uh, they would offer licensing for it and that it could be carried forward. Uh, they declined to state you know, whether a fee, fee may actually be judged. You know, so implementations such as Linux, which need to be open source and free, may potentially be encumbered. Uh, so this remains somewhat of an open discussion. Based on what uh, my process discussions have been, we have you no know, weak uh, but uh, positive force to actually take the documents and submit them to RFC. I'll be spending the next several days concluding discussions with people in ISG and otherwise 
to see what the process looks like, and uh, we'll take back to the mailing list what the process looks like for that. BFD v2 and other extending BFD discussions. Uh, the IETF 105 discussion was actually very positive. Uh, we did have a number of people working on various timing things, especially from the IPPM related group uh, group uh, documents. Uh, they did not personally find BFD a good fit for encapsulating their stuff. Uh, the general feel of the discussion had been to not overload BFD v1, which has you know, gotten significant traction within the industry for providing connectivity verification, and that we don't want to overload it, make it more difficult for it to do its core job. Was there room to leverage BFD PDUs and procedure, which is the motivation we seem to be seeing for putting uh, additional information into BFD for different things, including OAM. Uh, there seems to be some level of positive discussion on that. Uh, I need to find a way to generate a uh, discussion uh, with enough of the ISG to figure out uh, how we want to target such a thing, if at all, because uh, by expanding the scope of what it carries and who gets to use it, we potentially have this work leave BFD as being the working group. We're effectively giving IETF a gift of a state machine. Uh, and past that point, how IETF chooses to use it is part of the charter discussion. Uh, Martin, did you care to say anything on this at this point or? Okay. Okay, so we'll, we'll continue this discussion with the ISG offline and uh, hopefully we'll have some level of traction on this point you know, for the uh, upcoming IETF 107. So first presentation is Greg, I think. And the clicker, as usual, does not seem to be working. <laughs> Sorry. OK. Um, OK, so um, as uh, Jeff uh, explained, uh, this captures um, the updates that um, were applied um, from the last meeting to before this meeting, uh, resulting from addressing some of the uh, director comments and the discussion that we had primarily with experts in VXLAN. So uh, the discussion were more related to VXLAN environment and what is allowed and how VXLAN is used rather than just to base B of D machinery. Um, one of the questions in uh, um, comments that we received in the working group or just past working group last call was the question of why, um, whether there was sufficient discussion of the working group of making the statement in the document that B of D echo is outside the scope of this specification. So uh, the chairs made uh, another call to the working group uh, asking for consideration and uh, comments. And uh, to the best of my recollection, there were no comments. So I believe that based on that, the chairs concluded that working group is agreeing with the statement that the, the echo is outside the scope. So which means that if somebody wants to do that, there will be another specification. But this specification does not address any aspects of uh, using BFD echo mode over VXLAN. Though, yes, technically that's, pro that's possible because it's uh, considered to be a single IP hub. Um, we had a lot of discussion on selection and use of destination MAC in the inner Ethernet header and IP destination address in the inner um, encapsulation, in an inner uh, IP uh, header. Also, uh, we discussed the number of BVD sessions between the pair of this, uh, two VTAPs and uh, with, um, 
what is management VNI and how it can be used for BFD over VXLAN. Next. So, yes, the destination MAC address question was raised uh, in a, a routing directorate uh, review, and uh, it suggested that uh, use of uh, some uh, MAC address is uh, intrusion on uh, tenant's MAC address space, and thus it's uh, not allowed in the XLAN. But uh, we did, we, um, actually, we had a proposal originally at some point is that uh, to use uh, allocated by YANA uh, MAC address. So since then, in the discussion, we decided, no, we uh, leave this uh, out. We removed it from the document. Um, we uh, formulated uh, this following text, and uh, this is a quote from the current version of the document. Destination MAC. This uh, must not be one of the tenant's MAC addresses. The destination MAC address may be the address associated with the destination VTAP. The MAC address may be configured or it may be learned via a control plane uh, protocol. Details of how the MAC address is obtained outside the scope of this document. Um, further, um, and this discussion is not yet closed because uh, we further recommend, uh, recommend uh, to use uh, loopback, one of the loopback uh, IP addresses, whether for IPv4 uh, range or v6, and we leave um, MAC address uh, for this uh, destination IP address basically pointing to this text. So we have, a, we, we have unresolved uh, comment proposal to use, to define some default MAC address that will be used if the destination IP address is a loopback. Uh, in my opinion, and uh, I talk with Santosh about it, so like in active uh, editors of the draft, um, that it still goes back to the dedicated uh, MAC address, even to the more limited scope applicability. So, which probably we don't want to do. Uh, yes, uh, probably in some implementations of VXLAN that look only at their uh, destination MAC address of an inner header, and then might not look an IP payload. Uh, there might be a problem. So, I, I haven't heard from the author of this uh, proposal that um, he is okay with the current text. So, in my opinion, this proposal still stands, and uh, I think that it's up to the working group to decide uh, how to handle it. Okay. Uh, further, um, so what we are stating is, that, and again, these are all quotes from their uh, current uh, version. VTAP must validate the packet if the destination MAC of the inner Ethernet frame matches one of the MAC addresses associated with the VTAP, the packet must be processed further. If the destination MAC of the inner Ethernet frame does not match of the VTAP's MAC addresses, then the processing of the received VXLAN packet must follow the procedures described in the VXLAN RFC. Uh, if the BFD session is using the management VNI, and we have uh, discussion in a section six, a BFD control packet with unknown MAC address might not be, must not be forwarded to VM because just it's not bomb procedure. Um, I think that there is agreement with this text. There is no comments to this text. Okay, next, please. Now on IP address. Um, because we had a lot of uh, good input from people familiar with existing implementations of BFD over VXLAN, um, the following statement uh, uses should, not must, even though uh, editors of the document were quite inclined to use must here. Um, so you can see it. Uh, it says should use one of the loopback. <laughs> I I knew that will happen. <laughs> uh, 
uh, should we use one of the loop addresses? And again, that is because we were told that there are implementations that hard coded using different than that, and we're not told that they can be configured for something else. So, uh, Matthew Bocci, Nokia. So, in, in the past, when we've sort of tunneled BFD, we've always set it to 127 slash 8. Um, I, I would say even more generic. When we do any IP uh, OEM over the uh, tunnel, yeah. we use loopback. Yeah, and I, I can't And it's uh, OSP ping uh, or, and BFD. Actually, BFD followed the same because the first one, it was uh, RFC 4379 which changed uh, the loopback um, in another RFC, I think, 11.22. And, and that was for a pretty good reason, I think, was something to do with yeah. if it gets extracted at the wrong part along the place along right. the path, so you don't forward it, so you can't use it as an attack vector into anything. Absolutely, yes. That um, might... Yeah, and, and, and we've also, I've also come across sort of interoperability issues with things like early implementations of seamless BFD and LSP BFD, where people have sort of some implementations will check for 127 slash 8, some won't, and some will discard if it's not 127 slash 8. And I, I'm just worried that if you're, if you're implementing this on a box that's also doing all sorts of other flavors of BFD, you're going to run into issues if you allow anything other than 127 slash 8. Uh, again, my understanding is that uh, this is something that a working group can decide. So, speaking personally rather than as a chair, I think we all agree that if you're writing this from scratch and you had a you know, clean implementation, the procedure here is the right thing to do. And the proper thing likely to do as an industry is just simply to pressure people to conform with this. Certainly, you know, you as an implementer have that choice simply by making sure that your stuff doesn't interoperate with things you consider broken. Yeah. Um, I don't know if there's some way of... Um, Matthew, uh, you are suggesting that we should have a must in place of the should. Well, personally, I'd rather do that, yeah. Um, okay. Um, could you at least write down, uh, so Martin Vigo is speaking, sorry. Could you at least write down what are the risks of not respecting that should? Are you asking him to basically rewrite the reason why 4379 says to not do this? Yeah. Maybe appropriate to put a reference in as to why 4379 okay. did. Yeah. Okay, uh, that, that will be easy. Maybe in the security consideration section, write something to say? Just to um, say. I, I think that, in, well, no, I, I think that uh, we um, had more extended uh, text why we said TTO1. But uh, yeah, that, that, that will be not a problem, absolutely. Okay, okay. okay so. Um, should we take it as a working group decision or it will go to the mailing list? I, I think documenting the security considerations just... Yeah, no, but uh, changing to must. Because I, I think that, yeah, documenting its uh, informational part, uh, but uh, I think that more important is changing should to must. Is the implementer that does this willing to identify themselves? Um, I can dig through the email, but we can just uh, announce it and just wait for people to scream. Yeah, so the, the motivation to force the change, you know, just simply say, you know, you have to be compliant, is that we want to make them do things. As best I remember the working group discussion, we have uh, currently two parties that actually implement this. So we have enough that verify that people can actually do things in an interoperable fashion. The problem with taking early implementations is people are taking the risk to help refine the technology and you know there's some expectation that they eventually become conformer with the documents but there's also a desire on their part that by partaking of the process we don't force them into the position that they regret actually uh, doing things early so the question becomes what level of disincentive are we providing by you know making them nonconformant and then you know documenting uh, 
that were going to break their interop by fiat? I think it depends how widely deployed they are. That's my question. So uh, let me stick an arbitrary name in there that I do not believe is the party, but you know, VXLAN is, uh, VMware is actually the one that did this, and you tell them, well, you can't do that, and they're not conformant, how many people do you think are going to write implementations that um, actually you know, take care of that? Yeah, actually, uh, since we have one of the editors uh, familiar uh, with their, uh, what their concern are, BFD or VXLAN is not their concern anymore because they transition to another uh, overlay protocol. But, you know, but you see if there's still a lot out there, it's gonna be, everyone's going to have to accept packets that have been yeah. on 127-8. Yeah, and yeah. typically the way we see most of these implementations behaving is people will throw on a knob to turn on non-compliant mode for whatever reason, and as long as the default is covered by the should, you know, it yeah. takes care of both the security considerations and you, know, you basically have an implementation knob of last resort. It's ugly. It's just what's common practice. Yeah. It's ugly and a headache, and is that development and testing and oh. <laughs> okay, yeah, um, kind of holds up the yeah, we, we do, stuff. Uh, I, I think the normative, uh, our normative uh, dictionary does not have strongly recommend <laughs> for. <laughs> so we have only must and should, which is recommend. We have should not. Yes, but you could say should not rather than must not be. <laughs> yeah, we or we can do double negative. Um, so what we're going to do at, at this point? So we forget about existing, we ignore their uh, pain, or we'll just. I th I think the discussion that we've had, you know, across that three hundred messages, mm -hmm. I think that was almost seventy of the messages. Yeah, and. My feeling of the consensus for the conversation is the should gets the feature out there. It encourages people to do the right thing. And implementers that choose not to interoperate with them have the option to do so. OK, okay so then uh, we just add uh, text to uh, security consideration explaining uh, the choice and probably pretty much cut and paste uh, text from uh, for the 379 or 8029, which is 9. Yes, and if we wish to be religious in there, we could also add in a sentence saying that uh, implementations that previously did this for early deployment purposes really should, capital oh, S. Well, of shame, yes. Yes, and we don't have to shame them. We just have to tell people to do the right thing. <laughs> OK, our number will be these sessions in management VNI. and uh, So the current version stresses that in most use cases, single uh, BFD session between two VTAPs is sufficient to monitor continuity of their VXLAN tunnel. But uh, we do recognize that uh, there might be cases when um, operator would like to do monitoring per VNI. Uh, and uh, then they are free to choose that. Uh, also, uh, what we introduce is that um, operator may designate one of the VNI that doesn't have any tenant uh, as management VNI, and then use this VNI uh, to monitor VXLAN tunnel. We refer to this as a management VNI, similar to uh, management VLAN, but we do not uh, specify which uh, VNI number should be uh, used. We just indicate that may use VNI number one. Uh, we had some discussion. Some people suggested to use VNI number zero, but we were informed that there are some uh, hardware and some other considerations that uh, might limit the use of VNI zero. So we decided to recommend, uh, well, not recommend say, may use VMI as a default value for management. Um, which actually, all this discussion led me to think, and uh, something that probably we should, can discuss with the NVO3 group, uh, is do we want to have, for the sake of Geneva document as well, a document which discusses use of management VNI at more extent? Uh, 
I, I think yes, for sure. I mean, this is going to end up being very similar, I would think, between. Yes, because yeah, exactly. that, that was, <laughs> again, I, I kind of can see this same discussion or this same text being repeated, so probably better to have some document which yeah. makes it more uh, deterministic. Okay, so we probably will get to that sooner than later. Open questions. Yes, we do have some open questions. And uh, again, as I mentioned already earlier, uh, we do have a uh, proposal uh, to have some uh, default value for the MAC address in case that management VNI is used for BFD session. Um, so in a small text underneath, you see that, um, yes, they say it uh, simplifies configuration, um, but at the same time, um, in my opinion, it goes back to their um, allocated number. So my impression from the text is that we go back to an IETF allocated number here, and this almost is a request to NVO3 to designate this number in that new management doc, uh, uh, management instance document that this is the MAC address that it should get by default if it doesn't otherwise choose one. Is that a valid interpretation? Uh, there was no that suggestion because uh, actually uh, there um, future work on management on more uh, general management VNI document. Uh, we haven't got any further rather than realization that yeah, that might be a good community service. Um, so, again, um, I understand their interest and uh, rationale of uh, having some well-known default uh, MAC address here. Uh, again, it's limited because the proposal is that to use this number only if it's management VNI. Um, but at the same time, so it's the same um, whether it's any way uh, can intrude on a tenant space. So because what guarantees the tenants would not allocate something randomly. Mm -hmm. So my, my uh, personal impression for this is that uh, we likely should not ask IANA for a specific address that it is reasonable for this current version of the document that we're trying to RFC to say that a number should be used, uh, uh, supplied by the user. If we do actually end up with a uh, management instance document for NVO3, it is not unreasonable to ask uh, that document to potentially update this RFC to hmm. supply this as a default. So this is sort of a backdoor way to maybe add it at a later point if this is a thing that NVO3 wishes to do. But if you don't have a well-known MAC address, aren't you asking every implementation to have a configurable knob for the far end MAC address? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it does make it very clumsy. Because I think I, I can't I think we had discussions similar to this with some other forms of OEM and MPLSTP and, and people just push back and push back and said but we do really don't want to have that sort of configuration. Well, it could be configuration with the control plane. And this, this pigeons. Is a, this is a, what's control plane? This is <laughs> no, a no, common... Pigeons. Okay, <laughs> pigeons. Yeah, this is a common discussion for BFD. We're defining the protocol mechanism. The bootstrapping of this is going to probably go on top of something else. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, actually, I, I, I do favor a proposal that Jeff made because uh, the document which is more generic and will address the management VNI for all overlay protocols uh, and will set for all other protocols rather than BFD. So if we define it here, that will be the wrong place because it will be limited or might be viewed only as applicable to BFD. I think it should be applicable to all communication be uh, between VTAPs because management VNI is a control and signaling channel uh, between VTAPs. So any communication between them over this channel uh, should be using, uh, if we decide, should be using this MAC address, including BFD. Okay. 
So let's take that uh, forward. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, so, uh, okay, then uh, the uh, proposal or this, okay, is it proposal or decision that will uh, uh, not address this uh, request in this document? That, I think that is the reasonable thing to do. Uh, that's the consensus we currently have from the mail mm -hmm. discussion. Uh, we provided a possible path that allows us to add it after the fact. Updating other RFCs is a reasonable thing to do. Mm -hmm. And this means that we can unblock this document through the RFC queue. And depending on exactly how much work there is to do in NVO3 for such a management document, maybe that comes out much faster than this. Uh, OK, let's, let's make a chase. Uh, fine. Um, strong normative uh, for the use of VNI1 so basically a change from uh, May to recommendation. Um, again, this is open question to the uh, working group. Uh, many pointed out that the fact that VLAN 1 is, my understanding, de facto standard v, uh, management VLAN. Again, I, I, I couldn't find any uh, normative reference to v, uh, VLAN 1 being management VLAN. But in my, from my experiences, yes, that's usually what's being configured. So um, I, as an editor or with the Santos too, so we think that the current text is uh, reasonable. So again, no action here. Yeah, right. Okay, good. And last, actually, it was questioned uh, almost at 11th hour from Santos himself. Um, so demand mode is not mentioned in the document explicitly, and is it indication that it's outside the scope of the draft? And if it's outside the scope of the draft, should we have the same statement similar to uh, in regard to BFD echo mode? So for BFD echo mode, the consideration is traffic that needs to be encapsulated outside the protocol. So that's the reason why it has to be explicitly set outside because uh, we have to have the discussion what the forwarding for such echo packets would look mm -hmm. like. For demand mode being on top of async, it's a base, you know, the demand is part of uh, 5880 as core feature. Uh, it, unless there is a reason we think that it breaks for some strange reason, in this environment, then we don't need to mention it because it's just a supported feature. Okay. Um, okay. Being pedantic, do you think that we need to have some uh, clarification to that along the line that you just mentioned, I, or I do just not. leave it as is? Just leave it as is. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> okay. And um, with that, uh, I think that uh, we have one action point to the editors to add the text, uh, which is pretty clear. And uh, then for the working group chairs to decide what we do next. So we've completed the working group last call. We've gotten substantial uh, feedback. The amount of text change as part of the feedback has been relatively small. So mm -hmm. what that means is we've mostly converged on those points. Yeah, we mostly talked. Uh, you know, we've, we've reached chief consensus, which is all we can do. Uh, so once you've added the other item, uh, we can each take a quick editor, editor's pass through things, but uh, the working group last call has concluded. Mm -hmm. And uh, once we have the new version, we'll advance it to the ISG. Uh, okay, would we have uh, AD review and comments? No, no, I'm not asking. I'm not asking for it. I'm just... Um, okay, so, okay, in, in the meantime, so we'll get to our action point and we'll report when it's ready. Okay, thank you, Greg. So this will be a very brief update on BFD for large packets. Uh, I'm speaking in the context of a you know, contributor rather than as grouping group chair. So a very, very brief update. Uh, we requested working group last call for version one because we thought it was done, didn't 
you know, see any additional things needed to be added. And as is often the case, the IETF, this scared people into looking at the draft. Uh, we got a lot of uh, feedback, uh, I think, in particular for Douglas Ginsburg. Uh, the points that we addressed from that feedback in uh, draft 02, which is currently published, is there's more operational discussion about detecting MTU mismatches. There's more discussion about uh, ECMP impacts. That one, I think, uh, in particular came from Robert Rushuk. Uh, one of the open items to have text written is still discussion about uh, how this operates with regards to SBFD procedures, where the reflector basically is a passive entity in most cases. Do we want to make sure that it uh, reflects a specific MTU, or you no? Know, could we choose discriminators that each? So we're going to address that as part of O3. Uh, we did not specifically make any protocol changes uh, as part of the O2 considerations. You know, this is mostly operational ones. Uh, the O3 ones will be minor protocol discussions for SBFD, but again, the main procedures themselves shall not be altered. So since we believe that we may have addressed uh, all the operational considerations that were brought up, uh, we'll request that uh, the working group last call you know, be re-reviewed -re for the O3 version, and then uh, we'll see about advancing that based on that. Uh, as mentioned in prior presentations, we do have interop between uh, no Juniper equipment and no, uh, some software beta stacks and seems to work perfectly fine. Any questions? Okay. Our next presentation is on the one armed BFD use case. Uh, so who has not signed the blue sheets? Everybody has signed the blue sheets, yes? Okay, please advance the blue sheets to the middle of the room. Uh, if you could take the microphone here. Okay. And uh, please, so, I yeah. do not know who you are. Yeah, I, I think maybe five minutes is enough. And uh, uh, this is a very... Uh, sorry, sorry. Would you please state for the microphone your name? <laughs> How about this? No, no, not your volume. Who are you? <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Wei Chang Cheng from China Mobile. And uh, uh, this uh, use case, uh, uh, we just uh, 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 we, we just use it in our uh, data center network. And uh, uh, next page. I, I have to advance, unfortunately. Uh, okay. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Uh, so the. Application scenario is very simple uh, because when we uh, deploy the uh, uh, data center, maybe uh, we did not um, open uh, BFD. But uh, in some application scenarios, such as uh, if we want uh, to use data center for our uh, telecom uh, VLF, that means uh, something like that uh, we call the telecom cloud. At that application scenario, we need to improve the uh, uh, avail availability of the uh, data center. So we hope to uh, rise the BFD between the uh, gateway and the NIC of the VIM. Uh, at that application scenario, uh, because of, you know it's very hard for the NIC to support uh, the BFD protocol. So we want to use uh, uh, something like uh, the echo mode to uh, run the BFD functions. Uh, in the gateway side, uh, we uh, run the BFD uh, protocol and uh, uh, give um, uh, the destination MAC address to the NIC. It, but the IP address to itself. Uh, you know, that is um, uh, uh, overly network, and the VX line will um, forward the uh, BFD packet to the NIC directly. And uh, when the NIC received the packet, it got the IP address and uh, wrote it back to the gateway. So that uh, uh, in uh, the uh, this application scenario, 
uh, no BFD rest in the NIC, and then uh, we still can use BFD to monitor the link's uh, quality. So next uh, page. So uh, we compiled uh, this application scenario uh, and the function uh, to the current BFD RFC. We found that uh, the ICO function is used uh, on the two systems that deploy the BFD. But uh, our application scenario, uh, as I just mentioned, uh, uh, in the other side, there's no BFD rest. And the next page, uh, we also uh, see the uh, BBFTR uh, 146. And uh, it gives some description. I think it's similar to the um, uh, current uh, RFC. So uh, it's also not uh, give the clear description uh, if the both sides uh, of the system uh, need to uh, rest the BFD together. Okay, next page. So uh, the, 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 the question for us is that uh, does ICO function require remote peer node to support BFD protocol? It seems like it's not clear in current uh, RFC as well as the current uh, BBF uh, document. So uh, the other question is that uh, whether does something else need to be considered with uh, ICO scenarios such as the BFD young model. So uh, our next step or uh, our uh, propose uh, is that uh, it might be uh, modify the current uh, RFC to clarify uh, the BFD ICO functions, or uh, maybe we can give an informational draft to describe uh, the BFD uh, functions uh, at the scenario I just mentioned. So that's all, thank you. Okay. So I will start speaking. If I'm too fast, feel free to ask me to slow down. <laughs> um, about four years ago, I think, maybe a little bit longer, I started receiving strange emails at work asking about running BFD with Echo without actually having the BFD protocol in use. You know, this seemed like a very strange scenario to me, and I couldn't figure out what the request actually was, uh, when you look at what was actually requested for support from the routers and from the hosts, really they asked for a packet loopback for BFD echo port to actually be enabled. And it's like, okay, I understand this is not a bad way to test uh, whether or not uh, you have remote connectivity. Um, but when there is no BFD protocol involved, there is nothing for BFD necessarily to standardize. So I didn't understand the nature of the question. And then uh, a little over a year ago, uh, somebody made me aware of the broadband forum PR146 document. Mm -hmm. And this gave me why people were asking about it. It was because another uh, standards organization had decided that they were going to try to make use of a small piece of our functionality, but in a way that uh, was not well specified. Uh, their, their document has errors in it. This is an understood thing. Um, and it is, as you say, one-sided or one-armed. Uh, you know, the, the protocol literally is, from BFD's perspective, shut off. You know, what we have is effectively some switch that we turn on, you know, the echo function, regardless of whether or not BFD has been negotiated. So we're sort of using a piece of the BFD machinery, and we certainly could use the piece of a BFD echo implementation that understands, you know, interruptions to loop, that things are up or things are down, and report it to a client protocol. So certainly somebody's BFD implementation could be 
let's call it broken in this way so that this functionality was uh, t took effect. Where the discussion is interesting, uh, so you're, you're, you're the first to bring this to IETF to ask about this. Um, BBF has not come to IETF. I found out about this completely by accident. Uh, and as I mentioned, their document is not quite right. And uh, one of Juniper's uh, members of BBF has said that they may write a updated version of the document at a later point in time. Where this leaves us is uh, an interesting position of IETF does not describe this behavior. BBF has some description of the behavior, but it's not correctly described. Uh, the functionality is useful, but BFD as a protocol itself is not actually active on this session. So to some extent, we're describing how a broken BFD could be used. So our problem is IETF is, do we wish to put a document together uh, that effectively republishes the scenario from BBF, maybe with corrections in an IETF context? Um, part of that is having a discussion with Martin R. A. D. to figure out if this fits into the charter. Part of the discussion is uh, discussion with you know any liaisons we may have with Broadband Forum to figure out you know why did you use our protocol in the first place without talking to us. But um, but uh, I, I think the the point you're bringing to the Berkman Group and thank you for the presentation is. Uh, that this is a helpful piece of functionality. Uh, and you also gave an example of could we maybe extend Yang to cover this uh, behavior so that such things could be configured. So um, there is possibility for the work. Uh, you know, certainly if you wish to be one of the authors on the document towards IETF, that mm -hmm. can be done. But uh, there are many process discussions that have to happen first. No problem. I think it it's a uh, will be very useful because uh, currently a lot of um, overly network uh, is a deployment mm -hmm. uh, de deployed uh, not only uh, within the data center such as the v uh, v VX line as well as uh, you know uh, one system named uh, SD one mm -hmm. especially for some uh, uh, industry internet. So maybe this kind of function can be used in more application scenario. So that's useful. Yeah. Right. And, and we have, uh, I think, two open questions that uh, make this potentially a little more difficult. Um, <clears throat> no, the first observation is that uh, IETF has sometimes republished another doc, another working groups, uh, sorry, another standards bodies document in an IETF context as an RFC. Uh, sometimes that's actually a handover where we take over maintenance of work for them. The issue that we do have to verify before we can start to progress is uh, since BBF is a standards body, do they have an intellectual property restriction on uh, their proposal? So um, even if we wanted to do work on this, uh, we would have to figure out the status of that to the start. Uh, yeah, but uh, the, I think a BFD uh, raised by uh, BBF, uh, by uh, uh, IETF, and I think IETF is a host of the BFD. <laughs> so I, I personally agree with you. However, lawyers do not. So, um, <laughs> we will we'll have a larger question, I think. Yeah. OK. Nice. Um, Les Ginsburg, I just, this, this is kind of interesting. The, but I'm wondering about the interactions with the various forms of strict mode. Um, I think that would be problematic. Because you oh, don't yes. actually have a BFD session, and particularly, you don't have BFD at all on the peer. So, yeah, the, the sort of weird observation I've made as this has come up uh, at my job over the prior years is that they're using BFD echo packets to do the job. And if I had to take a guess as an engineer, there's probably some sort of you know, commodity silicon vendor that happens to have a BFD echo loopback programmed into their hardware that makes this cheap and easy. Um, and people are just using that. But uh, this could be ping. <laughs> you know, literally any mechanism could be used that tests the remote activity. And you know, the BFD uh, state machinery for clients could be used to echo it back. Um, 
actually um, thanks to uh, bringing uh, this uh, TR 146 um, to attention I, I was not aware of it and uh, when I read it um, I believe they do use not only BFD echo they use a combination of uh, pole sequence to communicate diag modes um, and and actually that's where I found mo more uh, mistakes and error misconceptions uh, and no reference to the final for example uh, they just say oh we send the reply <laughs> which is not uh, accurate termino at least terminology I, I, I can understand what they mean but the terminology is wrong um, so I I think that, again, um, we have this week uh, David Sinecrop, so if we want to communicate something to uh, BBF that he can put on the liaison head and uh, we can use that. And actually the good thing is that uh, BBF uh, member meeting is one week from this week. I, I believe it was David that brought 146 to my attention the first time. Ah, okay. Uh, actually, I would be surprised because uh, when I mentioned to him, he gave me this stare look that, ah, uh, <laughs> okay, so, okay. But might be at, at some time back he knew about it and it, just it, forgot. It was it was either David or uh, uh, one of Juniper's internal people. Well, or it could have been David uh, Dave Allen. Yes, because, it was Dave Allen. Sorry. Yes, because actually it's out of uh, his and Dave Thorne uh, old uh, working area. Okay, the document. So, Mark Chen from Huawei. So, I think uh, this idea is very interesting. I think it's very useful uh, for some scenario. Uh, in my personal opinion, I think there may be some protocol uh, work need to be defined in this working group because. Uh, for the traditional BFD session, we need to set uh, to set the. Uh, I only need to set our um, my discriminators right, which which we use the protocol to learn the uh, discriminator of the remote side. Mm -hmm. But for this uh, one called uh, one arm BFD, we need to set both. So there may be some different some different work um, protocol process need to be done for this solution so based on my understanding talking to people who seem to have some flavor of this implemented um, the, the whole issue here is that they don't want to put any BFD machinery into the effectively it's a host device at the other side to like a media gateway for cable networks that sort of thing very dumb boxes and they're relying on the packet loop to simply fulfill the need so this is very bad from the working group's perspective because we don't have any negotiation that can help the uh, BFD sender figure out what you know, packet speed the receiver actually wants to get. So this, this is probably okay for the people who did this work because for their environment they knew what speed they were willing to support. It's either very slow or they, they know how fast they can safely you know, do things. Yeah. You're absolutely correct that if you're trying to do this in a safe fashion you would be using a full BFD implementation that its only purpose is to say, I'm not willing to do fast async. I'm going to go into demand mode immediately. Feel free to use Echo. You would get the same profile, but to do so, you would actually need to have enough of a BFD implementation to run the state machine. Yeah, I think, yeah, uh, yeah. For, for that, for, for that uh, aspect, I think I agree with you. There no need some protocol extension between the local side and remote side, but for the local process and uh, based on the current uh, um, process, and I think we need some modification to the current process and to you know to how to handle this. You know, we have the same discriminate. No, maybe you no. Know. No discriminators. Remember, this is Echo, and it's literally just IP packets. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very dumb mechanism. Yeah. Um. But aren't you kind of echoing yourself in a way? I mean, I, the thing that springs to mind with this is there's another OEM mechanism called LSP self ping, where you just re, you just flip the packet, you just address a packet yourself and send it into an LSP, and it comes back. Yeah. Well, but that's that's the nature of the echo. Kind of yeah. So so that's what I'm wondering about the the, the negotiation you're talking about is really you're negotiating with yourself because it's just a route. Yeah. Route you, back. 
you just uh, send it out uh, and yeah. uh, because of the remote side and uh, that cannot that is very uh weak uh, right. uh, system and uh, but uh, it can route back as a packet so maybe we can use a very low speed uh, uh bfd packet read but uh, we can check the linkers mm -hmm. quality that's enough Right. And and calling it a BFD packet is a little misleading. Uh, it's BFD echo packets are just data. Yeah. It just happens to be to a well-known port. Yeah, uh, Louis Chen. Uh, one direction maybe uh, from the echo side is right now actually do not require echo side to do anything, right? No. So therefore, actually for troubleshooting and also for uh, some other statistic collections, right? Uh, we may specify the format. So that the echo size can optionally okay, turn on to get the statistics, so that the troubleshoot to look at what happened in the networks and what how many sections we established. So those are things may be useful in some places actually. But you need to identify who are the sender. I think that is the important, which is the discriminator or license information embedded into the packet itself. Yeah. Um, actually, um, I think that this exchange uh, brings very good question that was somewhere in the back of my mind is uh, would be good in this document even when we write it that to explain what exactly can be uh, verified and monitored using this technique right. yeah. so that to have uh, right expectations uh, and I want to point out that echo uh, works only over a single hop yep. okay so it could be a tunnel so, but you're still crossing a single hop, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, relaying a question from Robert Rashuk and uh, Jabber was, is spoofy protection, spoofing protection considered in this echo mode? And you know, Greg, you just answered a portion of the question, which is that uh, it's single hop only, you know, whether it's a tunnel or not. Uh, but beyond that, uh, this is just a echo functionality and you know, the remote side exercises no protocol behaviors at all. So it is up to the sender to put something into the packet that uh, they would recognize. You know, the BFD 5880 spec does not talk about that at all. Um, it's my impression from having talked to other implementers that uh, sometimes they'll put you know, proprietary stuff in there that does attempt to look for it. Uh, they're not going to publicly say what they do. That said, you can fire up TCP dump and you know, look at it, and you'll probably get a, a guess on it. Yep. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I think the actions for the working group is you know, we'll continue discussion on the mailing list. We'll discuss things with the BBF and figure out how to take this forward. OK. Thank you. And that concludes our content. Uh, we will probably be meeting as uh, part of the upcoming IETF. And, uh, you know, Thank you for coming to IETF for 106. Oh, that's the whole thing. Uh, basically, the way to picture this feature, you know, like I said, it, this surprised me. They kept on coming back because they never described why they called it DFD. Um, but 46 finally told me that.